Welcome to This is Affiliate Marketing with Sean Collins. On each episode, Sean interviews a new guest related to the industry so you can learn more about the people of affiliate marketing. After all, affiliate marketing is about the people, not the companies. Enjoy the show. Hi, this is Sean Collins here with This is Affiliate Marketing. And today I'm here with Nadim Azam. How are you doing today? Excellent, Sean. How are you doing? Wonderful. It's... It's great to have somebody else who's been around in the industry for decades. <laughs> a couple of old <laughs> yes, timers. Yes, I think, uh, I think we, we started at almost exactly the same time, didn't we, uh, Sean? Was it 1997 for you as well? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, I guess the funny thing there is that back then, there were, it was sort of impossible for the two of us to even meet each other online because there weren't really any kind of forums or blogs or podcasts or anything. Exactly. Yes, we probably have to wire it, you know, viral message to each other from one side of the Atlantic to the other. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Back then, I had, I was working at a, a company. Was they're trying to emulate Amazon, but for medical books, and so I was trying to recruit affiliates. And since nobody knew what an affiliate was, it was such a, a long process. To, I'd go to these different clubs at medical schools and try to get them to understand what I was trying to do, and it was like a half hour <laughs> just to, to explain the whole concept. So you are an affiliate manager rather than an affiliate. Yeah, so I um I came in sort of a, a backwards way where I, the in the summer of 1997, I stumbled across the Amazon affiliate program, and right. I just started playing around with it. And then I I was looking for some new line of work. I was working in magazine publishing, and I just answered an ad in the newspaper and went to this startup that was just trying to sell medical books. And I went in there, and they were looking for an affiliate manager, and I I just wanted something different. I didn't really care. And they, they just asked some of the, some questions about affiliate marketing. I just threw out some different terms that I'd read about in, in the Amazon program. <laughs> and, and that was enough to dazzle them to sneak in there. With well, this is really experience. eerie, Sean, because guess what? What I was working in magazine publishing myself before affiliate marketing. Oh, were you really? <laughs> yeah, how bizarre. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was in, um, I worked in the circulation end for a lot of the computer titles, a company Miller Freeman and later Ziff Davis. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, yeah, I was a journalist, so that's what I was doing before affiliate marketing. <laughs> yeah, well, the funny thing there is that I had, I wanted to be a journalist, and but I had, I was just trying to sneak in the back way through working on the business side, and I learned that, at least yes. in the U.S., that you don't really cross creative and business. There, there's sort of a wall there, and so I, I never managed to get over. I suppose so, yes. I, I see where you're coming from, yes. Yeah, but I, yeah, I was always... I always wanted to be a journalist, and and I I sold a total of one article in New York City back in the nineties for a hundred dollars. So, so that was the That's end of pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, but, it's but not that easy. That it, it's not also. easy. Yeah. Um. Well, so I I saw there was a, a picture of you on Instagram with a mannequin of Muhammad Ali, and so were you a, a fan of his in particular, or do you like boxing in general? That was actually at Madame Two Swords, where there was a, an affiliate uh, event. Uh, I think it was last year, so I got a photograph with him. I was a, I was a fan of Muhammad Ali. He was a very inspirational figure, and obviously, uh, you know, anybody in business can relate to sports figures like him and what they achieved in their lifetime. So, uh, yes, very much an inspiration. Yeah, and he was. Yeah, I just remember. Yeah, I guess for us growing up at the same time and. And he was just such mm. a big presence. He was so charismatic and and he just successful and and sort of boastful. He was an exciting figure back then. So I guess like every kid growing up was just sort of attracted to him. And then, then he had just had so many good quotable things he said over the years. So then it did translate into business later on. Exactly. Yes. So yes. So yeah, and that was a, a fun experience just to get my photograph taken with his mannequin. Yes. That's neat. So, and I saw on LinkedIn that you mentioned that you program video games for home computers starting back in the mid 1980s. What sort of games were you doing back then? So, I don't know if you remember the consoles, and I don't know if they were the same ones on the other side of the Atlantic, Sean, um, but we had computer consoles here um, co uh, called the Spectrum. The Sinclair Spectrum was one of them. Uh, another one, which I believe was an American computer, was the Commodore. Do you remember the Commodore 64? Yeah, remember the Commodore 64 and the VIC-20? Yes, the VIC-20 with the and, tiny memory, yes. <laughs> so was that Sinclair or was that Timex? Or was that a, cause Sinclair was a, is actually a British gentleman. He's a, he's called Sir Clive Sinclair now, and he's a British inventor. Uh, yeah, because so, there was a 
There was a computer yeah. from the Timex, the watch company called the Timex Sinclair. Oh, it was yes, a, yes. it was this little keyboard that you'd connect to your TV and you could just buy magazines and enter in like three pages of code to play some primitive game. <laughs> Oh, that was the bane of my life, you know, entering the code. So I'd sit there for hours and hours, you know, entering in the code from the magazines. And then it wouldn't work, you know, and there'd be a semicolon or something missing on line kind of 164. So I'd have to <laughs> go through it line by line by line. Yeah, that, that was maddening. And sometimes it would, I just remember doing that for like maybe up to an hour to enter all that code in. And there would just be like a, an asterisk skiing through Vs or something. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> The, the lamest game after all that work. <laughs> but, you know, Sean, that was the making of us because if we hadn't got involved in into the nooks and the crannies, you know, the coding, then, you know, we, we might not be where we are now. So, you know, I uh, it was a pain at the time, but we got to see beneath the bonnet in terms of how applications worked. And, you know, fast forward 20 years and look what we both ended up doing. Yeah, and I, I sort of, I never really connected that together, but I think that, I guess back when we were, when I was starting in affiliate marketing in the late nineties and mm. I, there wasn't really much of an option. So I sort of had to figure out HTML and I took some tutorials. Mm. I guess maybe if I wasn't used to playing around with code back when I was a kid, maybe that might have been intimidating, but I, I just jumped in and, and embraced it. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I guess the, the kids these days just jump right into WordPress. They don't realize what a struggle it was to write by hand back then to create sites. Exactly. And, and, you know, sit there with the cassette player, you know, and, and play the cassettes and have to wait five or 10 minutes, you know, before the game or whatever you were trying to use loaded up. So it's, it's so much easier now, but I, I would, I would not uh, change anything because I really do believe, you know, that uh, getting involved in terms of how these things were put together uh, has enabled me to, to be a better businessman. Yeah. That's fascinating. It's, it's so neat that you, you had things happening that early. And um, so did you also ever use the Atari computers, like the the 400 and the 800? Oh, Do you remember those? The dream. You know, I think even before the Commodore and the Spectrums of this world, you know, we had the old Atari console. I don't know which number came after it, but literally pretty much the only game there was on it was ping pong on a, on a, on a black and white screen. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, that? That, that very primitive yes. one. And then they had the 2600 that was like the more advanced one with the joysticks, but then they... They had actual keyboard computers. The 400 was like a, a membrane computer with or keyboard, so you had to oh, press yes. hard. And then the 800 <laughs> was like a, a regular typewriter kind of keyboard. Yes, yes. I didn't go. I think I jumped then to to, to using kind of uh, the, the Spectrum. And we had a computer here made by the BBC, uh, which was called the BBC Micro, which was phenomenal. And so I, I switched over from Atari to using the other machines. Yes. That's really neat. I wish I'd, at some point, I guess, when I, as I was growing up, I just threw all that stuff away. I wish I would have kept it. Yeah, they're real collector's items now. Uh, you know, yeah. people are selling them for, for an arm and a leg on, on uh, eBay and various places. Yes. Yeah, that's a shame. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I saw last month that you tweeted after a chain of serendipitous events. I happened to find myself in Yorkshire, placed in a bedroom directly overlooking my childhood kindergarten. So have you moved back to that area or are you just visiting? Uh, you know, Sean, it was, it was quite a, a dramatic few days, um, because, um, my, my aunt had, had passed away. And, oh, sorry about uh, that. I was literally, uh, not, uh, thank you. Thank you. And, uh, literally I was kind of somewhere else and I ended up going straight from there to the, uh, the funeral and, uh, literally, you know, had the clothes on my back and nothing else with me. And I ended up going from A to B to C. And before I knew it, I ended up staying in a relative's house. And uh, they took me up to the bedroom. And it was such an eerie experience because I looked down from the bedroom and there was my kindergarten from my childhood. Uh, completely unexpected. And I just sat there and, you know, thought of you know, Nadim as a, as a three and four year old. <laughs> That's really neat. Yeah, the... For, unfortunately for me, the my earlier schools were all raised at some point to just develop new things. So I, I guess I could never have that kind of moment. All right. How far away are you now from your kindergarten in terms of where you live now? Um, so it was pretty close to Washington D.C. So I, I visit oh, the sweet. area pretty often. My brother is still there, but the the city where I grew up, it was it's very different now. It just 
they just knocked down so many buildings to build new things and yes, and so, yes. so a lot of the history there got wiped out. It's got wiped out, yes. Yes, yes. So, yeah, I understand, yes. Yeah, so um, I guess this is more of a, a heavier question. I saw in Medium that you wrote about ending the racial, class, and gender bias in creative professions. So um, do you see any kind of solutions there? Or like, what kind of reasons do you think that that typically happens, like maybe nepotism or cronyism? Um, I, I, I think... I think people just have different, you know, kind of affinities to different perhaps lines of work. And uh, I think, you know, I don't think there's anything sinister going on as such. Uh, but I think in terms of the advertising realm, um, I think it's just heavily geared towards a, a certain type of person who maybe feels more more comfortable within that realm. So I think it would be great to have some fresh blood uh, and, and some new people with different, you know, perspectives in, in such a field because it will ultimately help the brands and the products to, to reach out to, to, to the wider communities. Yeah. And, and just the perspectives and things, I think it would certainly be a, a positive movement. And I, one thing I've seen in, um, not as much in affiliate marketing, but more so in, in search, a lot of the conferences, are trying to insist on having like an equal balance for genders for the speakers. And the, I think the one issue there though, is that typically I think at least for affiliate summit, we're usually about 80% male. So I think exactly. you're sort of maybe trying to shoehorn in and making it sort of an unfair process where you may not have the best and the brightest in some cases. And um, it's difficult. Uh, yes. Yeah. And the funny thing there is that we, when we look and we typically have the women, are more overrepresented as speakers than they are as attendees, but we just, it's all strictly on voting instead of trying to fill in spots. That makes sense. Yes. I think we're, we're quite fortunate in the affiliate marketing space in the sense that we have a good ratio of women as affiliate managers, for example. And uh, we, we see this within our own company at Azam Marketing, whereby all the guys involved in the IT side, you know, whether they're involved in CRM or email marketing or, you know, the coding work or the web design, they, they all tend to be blokes. And then uh, all the people on the affiliate marketing side, you know, as in affiliate managers, for example, they all tend to be women. So it ends up balancing out at the end of the day. Um, but, uh, yes. Yeah. I guess hopefully over the next generation, maybe things just – work out better and more equitable too. Cause I think maybe just still, we have like the older generations that are still in control in a lot of industries and, and they tend to maybe have more biases. Exactly. Yes. Uh, so, you know, I, IT is, is a very male dominated uh, field as, as you know, but I think the bound, uh, the, the barriers are beginning to come down and I think more women and more people from other ethnic minorities are beginning to enter that, that field. So uh, it's, it's a, it's a very exciting time. You know, if you look at what's happening in Silicon Valley and, you know, you know, some of the CEOs of some of the biggest corporations are, are, are people from Indian origins, for example. So I think the barriers are definitely beginning to come down and, uh, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. Yeah. That's exciting. And I, I love just, I guess that when the internet swept in, it sort of democratized a lot of things where before that, like we were mentioning with publishing and I went in there and it was sort of discouraging because there was a, a very, um, strict hierarchy there where you weren't going to get into middle management and get into a, your own office until you were maybe in your forties or fifties. And they're just, mm. they didn't, they just seemed so, so set in their ways that they weren't going to consider anybody, even no matter how bright they were to get away from the cubicle and to move up. And you just had to know your place for a long time until you could graduate up there. Completely. Whereas within our space, within digital, um, I, I, you know, what I love about digital is it's, it's very, uh, very much based on, on one thing and one thing alone, which is your skill sets and what you have to offer. So in that sense, uh, I, you know, I, I love this industry as opposed to more traditional fields. Yeah. Yeah. So do I by far. So I, I saw that you studied political science and government at your university. Did you ever want to work in politics? Yes, uh, that, that's always been a passion, a passion and an interest of mine. So I, I studied uh, political science and English literature and, and hence me moving into, into journalism. So I, uh, I moved uh, to London uh, and started working for the media here and was involved uh, for many years within uh, reporting for government, for, for politics and in terms of what was ha happening in that realm. 
So would you like to be like a strategist or would you want to actually run for an office yourself? I'm not sure in terms of uh, whether I have the ability in terms of myself. And I'm so embedded within within uh, digital now that uh, it's hard to find the time for anything else. But uh, I've been able to to straddle the two to some extent or other in terms of taking an interest and going to events. But uh, I have to make sure that I stay out of the realm when it comes to, to politics as such, because I don't want to be controversial. I don't want to drive away uh, clients and customers. So I have to stay fairly uh, impartial when it comes to expressing my own political views. Yeah, and, I, and I'm sort of fascinated. I'm not sure if it's prevalent um, in England or not, but in the U.S., some people that run their own businesses can be very polarizing with their opinions, very off-putting. I'm, I'm surprised that they would do that to the possible peril of their business. Absolutely. So people, uh, Sean, have been trying to tease out uh, out of me for decades now uh, in terms of, Nadine, which political party do you support? What's your opinion on Brexit? This, that and the other. Literally people who've known me for years and years. And, uh, you know, you'll notice I, whether it's on social media or anywhere, I've never, ever, ever expressed an opinion because ultimately as, a, as, as the manager of a company, um, I, I feel it's my role to to make every customer comfortable with using my services. And if I express strong political opinions, then that can only be detrimental to my relationship with my clients. Yeah, and I, I really don't see an upside to it either. And, and we've had a, a couple of people that were political as keynotes in the past, and I I worried for a second that it might have some kind of negative impact on it, but, but people didn't seem to be bothered by it. We had a... Um, there was a guy named Cory Booker who at the time was a mayor of a city. Oh, yeah. Now he's a U.S. senator, and he's he's um, rumored to possibly run for president in a few years mm. here. And, and we also had a, a guy named Frank Luntz who is a strategist who wrote a book called Words That Work. And um, right. And he has said uh, so. He has his book is fascinating. It it tells a tale of back in in the 1990s. He was sort of the architect of changing the language of the politics for the Republican Party in the U.S. and helping them to sweep in and win a lot of spots just by changing some phrasing like he they used to call it if somebody passed away a lot of their estate would be subject to an inheritance tax mm. and so he just rebranded that as a death tax since inheritance <laughs> tax had more of a like a, yes. a wealthy kind of connotation yes and so he just he went through and just changed the whole platform just the wording of it and it was fascinating from marketing angle that that, that enabled the all these politicians to to really flip the the power, and so so his book words that work is pretty neat to just see the an analysis of what he did there. So we had him speak, but I guess in both cases, one was a Democrat, one was a Republican, and nobody seemed to be bothered by the the parties there. They just enjoyed the wisdom of these guys. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, we we all have to learn from each other. I'll, I'll definitely check out that book for sure because that sounds fascinating. Yeah, and just the one thing that was really funny was I guess it was about six or seven years ago. And he had set up his own computer on the on the stand we had, and all of a sudden he started hearing these noises, and um, so I ran up to see what was going on. And as he was speaking, so he was um, even though it was still pretty recent, he was still using America Online AOL, and so he <laughs> was making all these noises as emails were coming into him. And so I was trying to shut that off because it was as he's speaking, it had like you've got mail, you've got and, mail, yes, <laughs> <laughs> the good old days. I remember those, yes. <laughs> But it's funny though, because that that was af that was way after pretty much everybody else in the country had abandoned that as a platform. <laughs> they would got much faster solutions, so it was sort of funny to see how how slow he was to adapt to the newer technologies, even though he was a leader in what he was doing. Yes, uh, yes, I see, I see where you're coming from. <laughs> that was sort of entertaining. Um, yes. So I, I saw on, on Twitter that you shared a list of fifty books from the past fifty years that everyone should read at least once. Have you been making it an effort to try to read all of those books? You know, the the thing is, um, I, in terms of business books, I, I think I'm I'm completely up there when it comes to reading business books and books on self development. I'm a bit of a self help junkie. Uh, in my local library uh, over here in London, uh, the limit is to withdraw thirty two books, and I max out on the thirty two books each oh, wow. and every time. And uh, not only that, but I'm actually a member of the the, uh, the libraries in the surrounding areas as well. I have a library card, so I, I think at the at the current time in my home, I've got about 
70 books out from the library, which is a little too much. <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, I'm a voracious reader uh, and I'm constantly trying to uh, read books and try to learn, you know, the strategies that are required to better myself as a human being and to better myself within the world of commerce and business as well. And so do you get many fines for having outstanding books? I'm actually pretty good because I set uh, reminders on, on my Outlook uh, calendar. So I, I have like a reminder saying, you know, renew book three days before the, the deadline and then two days before and then, then renew today, you know, with three exclamation marks. So I'm pretty good at that. <laughs> so can you renew the books online these days or do you have to go in? Um, it's all online now. So uh, the only thing is after six renewals online, then you have to go in person. So you have to uh, lug them down to the uh, libraries and uh, uh-huh. renew them. Uh, but it's, even in the libraries now, it's all completely uh, self, self-done. self So um, the last time I went to the library, an entire library was being run by, by two staff members. And you check in your books and you renew them all yourself. That's wild. Yeah, I haven't been in, in a library in quite some time, but in where I'm in Austin, Texas, they just built a, a beautiful brand new one. And so I'm curious to go take a look at it. And it just opened this week because I, had, at some point over the years, I, had, I switched from physical books to Kindle books just for traveling, liking to have them. Yes. Just a lot lighter. But I, I didn't, I missed the days of just making notes and dog earing the, the pages and things. Yes, it just brings me back to my uh, my childhood, you know, when I used to sit in the libraries. I, I literally used to live in libraries, and so I, I, I you know, I, 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 I ache to, you know, move away from my computer and just spend some time in the library just with paper books. I do way too much reading online nowadays, and so uh, I think there's nothing for the feel and the smell and the touch of a book. Yeah, especially when you have like a a book that's been around for a long time and it just just sort of like being curious about the history of it and who's read it and and just yeah that smell and everything and you can just sit out in a park and read that versus having like a some kind of device it's nice to have that that paper in your yeah, hand it's not the same on a kindle i i do i do appreciate the practicalities of a, of a kindle or an ipad but uh, yeah there's nothing for the feel of a real paper book yeah i absolutely agree well, um, thank you so much for joining me today. Can you let people know where they can follow you or reach you online? So I'm on uh, I'm on three of the social media platforms on, on the whole, and I, those are the ones I post on the most frequently, which is Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. So if people just look for me uh, in terms of Nadim Azam, which is N A D W E M. A Z A M, um, they can find me on all, all all of those platforms, and I also blog uh, quite intermittently i'd say on uh, azam.info which is a z a m dot i n f o very cool yeah i saw that you had gotten started on instagram but then decided to to post a thing saying to follow you in any other social media places so you just you didn't feel like doing the the picture sharing as much or you just wanted to focus on facebook for photos. Yeah, I, um, I I understand Instagram is enormous uh, and it's hard to to you know kind of not get involved in the Instagram community. But the thing is that from the perspective of our industry and marketing and, and business, uh, I think uh, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn are the most uh, you know kind of the, the the communities where we're most likely to get in touch with each other. So um, and there's not enough time in the day to be also updating, you know, the Pinterest and the Instagrams and the snaps of this world. Uh, I understand their work for, for for many people, but I decided just to consolidate to Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn, which is where, where most of my contacts hang out. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and I I do post fairly often to Instagram, and then I a lot of times I'll push it to Facebook as well. But it seems to be more generational that that people maybe in their twenties are far more likely mm. to be commenting and. And liking the post there, but versus our contemporaries. Exactly. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I, I love Instagram, but uh, I think uh, it's just simply a matter of time. So I've decided just to stick to you know three of the platforms. The other platforms, there's a Google Pluses and this, that, and the other. I have automated posts going out. To be completely frank with you, but I don't spend so much time on them. Yeah, and I, Google Plus seems to be pretty much just on life support now, anyway. <laughs> exactly. I, I think, you know, if you get one like or whatever they're called, a plus, 
on, on uh, Google Plus, then, then, you know, I get excited. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's literally on live support, like you say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm genuinely surprised when somebody makes a comment on something I have on Google Plus because I, I never think to go there. <laughs> likewise, likewise. I, we've just got kind of automated systems now. So if we, I post something on Facebook, for example, it will get syndicated onto Google Plus, but, uh, there, there's hardly any activity whatsoever there. Yeah. Yeah, I should do that because I it's it's tough to try to manage all these things. It drives me crazy, and then Snapchat too, and so much stuff. Yeah, definitely. I definitely recommend you know social media syndication tools um, because they're huge time savers. Yeah, but I wish I could also syndicate the interactivity of it to when people are commenting to respond to them. <laughs> That's the tough part, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great. Well, uh, well, thank you so much, and and have a wonderful day. Likewise, it's been a real pleasure, Sean. Yeah, great to chat with you, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you when you come over to London next year. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm excited for that. So, um, so thank you, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Have a great day, Sean. Thanks. Goodbye. Goodbye. So, thank you, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Have a great day, Sean. Thanks. Thank you for listening to This is Affiliate Marketing with Sean Collins. Sponsored by Affiliate Summit, the premier affiliate marketing trade show and conference since 2003. For more information on Affiliate Summit, visit www.affiliatesummit.com. You can find Sean at Affiliate Tip on Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. Or email him at sean at affiliatesummit.com. Whatever they're called, a plus uh, on, on uh, Google Plus, then, then you know I get excited. But uh, yeah, it's, it's literally on live support, like you say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm I'm genuinely surprised when somebody makes a comment on something I have on Google Plus because I I never think to go there. <laughs> likewise, likewise. I, we've just got kind of automated systems now. So if we, I post something on Facebook, for example, it will get syndicated onto Google Plus, but uh, there, there's hardly any activity whatsoever there. Yeah. Yeah, I should do that because I it's it's tough to try to manage all these things. It drives me crazy, and then Snapchat too, and so much stuff. Yeah, definitely. I definitely recommend you know social media syndication tools um, because they're huge time savers. Yeah, but I wish I could also syndicate the interactivity of it to when people are commenting to respond to them. <laughs> That's the tough part, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great. Well, uh, well, thank you so much, and and have a wonderful day. Likewise, it's been a real pleasure, Sean. Yeah, great to chat with you, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you when you come over to London next year. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I'm excited for that. So, um, so thank you, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Have a great day, Sean. Thanks. Goodbye. Goodbye. So thank you, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Have a great day, Sean. Thanks. Thank you for listening to This is Affiliate Marketing with Sean Collins. Sponsored by Affiliate Summit, the premier affiliate marketing trade show and conference since 2003. For more information on Affiliate Summit, visit www.affiliatesummit.com. You can find Sean at Affiliate Tip on Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. Or email him at sean at affiliatesummit.com.